a 14 year old streetwise in children's home together my mum wasn't there and because of my three younger brothers all being younger than me I kind of like looked to looked after them that way make sure that it was all right and everything when they were 14 they gave them a free travel card to give them as kind of like an independent so they'd get their own way to school instead of catching the coach but Jason got this travel card and started travelling all over the place and bunking off school and coming home and pretending he's been at school all day Some days after leaving home, Jason phoned his sister. She wasn't in, but he spoke to her fiance. Hello. Hello. Adam? Where are you? I'm staying with a friend from school and he's dead. Jason, where are you ringing from? I'm in South London. What's the number? I'm not saying. You coming home? Yeah. I'm thinking about it. I'll ring you tomorrow night and let you know. Right then. Bye. Bye for now. Dear Mum, I'm okay. I'm working with the fair at South End. So don't worry. See you soon. I'm going up north soon. Jason wrote twice, the first card postmarked Brighton and then from Crawley, Sussex. Dear Mum, I haven't forgot you, so don't worry about me. I'm all right. I will come and see you in the next few months. Happy birthday from Jason. The adrenaline starts running the moment that you get the call and you're thinking ahead. You're thinking more of what police action you, you intend to take rather than actually what is at the scene. And it's only when you get to the scene that you get briefed and you see the body for yourself that you start um, having feelings. The body itself was found by a local out shooting. He's in a bit of a state, actually. Mind you, it's not surprising. It's not the sort of thing he'd be likely to come across. The boy's naked, and there's no sign of his clothes anywhere. Right. It's just over here, sir. I've got sons, and well, one of them would have been about Jason's age, actually. And so you, you put yourself in to the place of the parents. And albeit at that time we didn't know who the boy was, who the parents were, but you get that same feeling uh, as a parent, as a caring parent. Yep, five foot five, yep. Missing two teeth, yep. Brown hair. And slim build. That sounds like the cell boy. Excuse me a moment, sir. We identified Jason fairly rapidly, I think, within two days and uh, the post-mortem was carried out on the evening of the day the body was found and uh, the cause of death was due to asphyxiation but there was signs that the boy over a period had been repeatedly buggered. There would have been one taken at the start of the summer term. It really was, yes. really was the saddest thing I could remember. Ah yes had a terrific effect on the whole school. Here it is. That's Jason, at the end of the front row. Jason was a loving, innocent um, little boy who was in need of love and affection and help, who um, perceived certain people as friends and helpers and suffered for it. In fact, before Jason left home for the last time, there'd already been fears among his family and school friends that he'd started associating with a group of older men. 
A poster campaign by police was aimed at anyone who might have seen him in the months that he'd been missing. Nearly two weeks ago, a farmer it's in Essex made a horrible discovery. The body of a boy, later identified as 14-year-old Jason Swift. Jason's whereabouts over the past We've few managed to get the murder on Crime Watch incident desk within a few days of the body being found. And this helped us fill in the period immediately following Jason's disappearance. Uh, in fact, we found a person who had rented a caravan out to Jason for a couple of days at Camber Sands. Uh, but beyond that, there was very little to go on. Jason referred to a school friend in, in his phone call to his uh, future brother-in-law and uh, that proved to be an adult homosexual that Jason had had a previous relationship with, who in fact looked after him for two or three days after he first went missing. Um, once we had inquired into that aspect uh, and eliminated the person from our inquiries, there was very little else to go on. Fifteen miles away in London, and in the week before Jason's body was found, Several parents had made reports to Hackney and Stoke Newington police of a man in an old Jaguar cruising the streets trying to entice children into his car. The number plate had been noted, but its owner wasn't registered, and so he wasn't found for several days. Morning, sir. Is this your car? Yes, it is. Why? Is there a problem? Can you tell me your name, please? Cook. Sydney Cook. Mr Cook, does anybody else drive your car at all? No. Why? I'd like you to come down to the police station. Don't worry about your car. My colleague will take care of it. Yes, but what have I got to go down the station for? Don't, don't worry about it, sir. We just need to speak to you. Go on your vehicle. Sidney Thanks, Cook please. was a local Hackney man who admitted to several offences of gross indecency. But he denied trying to abduct boys, and the case was never followed through. Cook became one of several dozen child molesters seen by detectives from the Jason Swift inquiry. He lived on the same estate as Jason and was a fairground worker. But that was wholly circumstantial evidence and police could find no other stronger links. We were looking at literally hundreds of men from similar backgrounds. It just seemed that the more we looked, the more we found. And Sidney Cook was just one of many. Just as Sidney Cook was being released in London, another murder hunt was getting underway. An hour ago, police in Essex announced that there is, in all probability, a second child killer on the loose. Pathologists have established that a body discovered in a shallow grave near Waltham Abbey is that of a boy aged between seven and nine. He'd been dead for between one and six. Since its discovery yesterday because of the bad weather. Once skies cleared this morning, dozens of police moved in to begin a painstaking search of the farmland. The child's body was found by a farmer as he was walking along the edge of his field. Three months earlier, on a Sunday afternoon in September 1985, six-year-old Barry Lewis had gone out to play in the streets near his home in Walworth in South London. All right, I'll see you later. I'm going home now. Bye. He just seemed to disappear into thin air. Every indication that we could find seemed to point to the fact that he had been picked up by a passing motorist. The Barry Lewis Incident Office got in touch with us virtually immediately, really. There were common features, such as the closeness in distance between where the two bodies were found uh, and the nature of uh, the area. Both of these young boys died from asphyxiation. They were both found naked, in shallow graves. They were in the fetal position. Both bodies had been uh, buried within 10 miles of each other. And quite clearly, a car must have been used to take them to those two different spots. Thank you. Well, that's been said, uh, What's more, it emerged that both boys had been drugged. There's two particular types, diazepam and tamazepam. Both are sedative tranquilizer type drugs. It's not unusual that either of the two drugs can be prescribed together, but it would be very unusual, in fact, for children 
as young as we're dealing with to prescribe those drugs by a doctor. Thank you. We were beginning to understand that the drugs were particularly used by paedophiles and as the drugs had been found in each of the two bodies, we suspected that it was likely to be the same killer. The Metropolitan Police and Essex Constabulary joined forces. This was the first time a combined operation had been formed under a single commander. Lessons had been learned from the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry, where manual card index systems used by different forces had allowed Peter Sutcliffe's name to escape attention several times. On this occasion, every scrap of evidence would be put on one computer database. One of the first lines of inquiry was had Jason been murdered by a homosexual pickup? Over Christmas, police met London's Rent Boys. The Rent Boys scene was, was a completely new scene to us. It's uh, something we, we don't have in Essex, fortunately. We learnt a great deal very quickly about them. Um, the young boys um, earning a living doing this uh, as rent boys. It seemed to us the younger they were, the more they could charge, and they knew this. Um, surprisingly, uh, very few of them were actually homosexual, um, and they were in it just for the money and they obviously learned very quickly that they could earn a lot of money and as I said, particularly the younger ones. Um, although, of course, we all knew that these things went on and they existed, but the degree and, and the amount involved surprised us all. On reflection, it wasn't the right area to look for Jason. Um, Jason, we learnt later, really was a lad who was a rent boy solely for the purpose of, of a free meal, a bed for the night, someone to show him a bit of care and affection, really. Um, not, not as a, a true professional in it for the money only. As is routine, we commissioned a second independent post-mortem to allow the boys' bodies to be released for burial. We chose Professor Austin Gresham because he often worked for the defence so we knew his findings would be very difficult to challenge in any future court case. Professor Gresham's work produced an even greater sense of urgency and disquiet. He agreed with the findings of the first post-mortem that Barry Lewis had probably been sexually assaulted and then strangled. But he found that Jason had died while sexual acts were taking place. Well, I mean, all deaths of children are very emotive. You know, it's very difficult sometimes to keep your head and to be impartial when you're dealing with these cases. It is unusual to find child abuse that has proved fatal with evidence of sexual abuse. I should say that um, over the 40 years I've been working, I've only seen two cases of child abuse where the child has died, of course, and there is evidence of sexual abuse as well. It is unusual. The findings took the inquiry into a totally different realm. The, we knew that Jason had been involved in homosexual activity previously, but what we didn't know was that he had been sexually abused immediately before his death. Basically, we were then looking for a very violent paedophile or a gang, a group of paedophiles. The prospect of a gang being involved had seemed improbable at first, but in the months after Jason's death, evidence from boys who'd been abused revealed that paedophile rings were more common than detectives had been aware. One ring, dubbed the Dirty Dozen, involved a man already known to the Jason Swift inquiry. Your surname? Cook. That with or without a name? With. Your first names? Sydney, Charles. And your occupation? Fairground worker. The ring included another man, Lenny Smith, who, like Cook, lived on the Kingsmead estate. Your age? Both Cook and Smith were questioned about Jason, but both exercised their right to silence, and the police got nowhere. Then, a year later, another inquiry in London uncovered a catalogue of abuse 
by a group of men posing as babysitters. As the um, 1987 inquiry at Hackney unfolded, it became apparent that there probably were connections. And uh, if you like, I, I became obsessed with the fact that we should find out about these connections and uh, uncover them. We made the decision to ask all the suspects about the Swift inquiry and the Swift murder uh, and about Jason Swift in general. And that's really how we broke ground on the inquiry. One of these routine interviews was with yet another man living on the Kingsmead estate, Robert Oliver. Hello, Robert. I'm Detective Inspector Bob Brown, and this officer is Detective Constable Stuart Foray. You have been arrested in connection with allegations of indecency on young boys. I would like to ask you some questions about those matters. Will you speak to me? Yeah. What about Jason Swift? Will you talk to me about him? You know about Jason's death, don't you? Will you talk to me? I've been wanting to talk to somebody for a while. Do you want to talk to me here, or do you want to talk upstairs in my office? In the office. I suppose it was beyond our wildest dreams that somebody would actually confess to this, which is what in fact happened. So there is an element of uh, surprise and almost elation at the fact that, um, uh, and achievement I suppose on the part of the, of the team who are involved, but um, there's no point in overreacting to that in terms of the suspect. He really shouldn't be aware of your emotions. Can you tell me how long ago it was you first met Jason Swift? 85, 85, 86, something like that. Where was it you first met him? With uh, Sidney Cook and Lenny Smith. What about the other times? Well, he used to come to the shoe shop. I've seen him in there. Which shoe shop? The shop I used to work in on Fridays. Jason used to come and ask the manager if he wanted any help doing things, you know, locking up or something. I know he'd uh, do anything just for a few bucks. The Hackney Shoe Shop was well known to Oliver and to others as a pickup point for rent boys. Um, Robert Oliver was um, a pathetic uh, individual. He, he'd had a particularly unfortunate upbringing. His mother used to send him to school dressed in girls' clothes. And um, I think the teachers, out of sheer frustration, used to buy clothing for him. Um, certainly by his mid teens, he had. had what I would describe as a major identity crisis, and he'd ended up as a, a, a rent boy. Um, he's really a lost cause, Rob Oliver, in many respects. Can you tell me more about Sid Cook and Lenny Smith? Well, I met Sid through Lenny. Introduced him as a friend from the estate, Kingsmead. Lenny, I've known uh, since he was in the West End as a rent boy. Do a lot of people know you're on the King's Maid? Detective Inspector Bob Brown managed to get Oliver to go on talking throughout the night. Over a period of nearly six hours, he told the detectives of his relationships with different men on the King's Mead estate and their connection with Jason in the months between his disappearance and the time he'd been killed. How was it that you came to meet Jason Swift again in that November? through Sid and Lenny. Do you know you were going to meet a red boy? No. All Sid said to me was that he had someone to meet, that's all. Where did you first see Jason on that evening? Lee Bridge. Opposite the toilets, by the pubs. Sid said, everything all right? He said, yeah, he's fine. And Sid just turned into the car park and had trade with Jason.
through that night, Oliver admitted a minor part in the affair himself and said Jason was abused and strangled in the front seat of the Jaguar by Sidney Cook and Lenny Smith. By daybreak, the detectives were elated, but still unconvinced. I believe the account that uh, Robert Oliver was there when the killing took place. What fussed me was whether or not um, it was strictly accurate. And I thought that maybe certain aspects of it may have been a figment of his perverted imagination. Uh, and maybe that he'd uh, uh, elaborated or made up certain aspects of the account. That's really why great uh, importance was placed on trying to corroborate it. One of the first people to see was Oliver's roommate, Leslie Bailey. Morning, Les. Sorry to bother you. That's okay. I want to talk to you about Robert, but uh, I've got a lot to ask you and it's going to take a long time. Will you come down the station with me? Yeah, no problem. We thought that Leslie might be a useful witness. And on speaking to him, I realised that he was bottling something up. I wanted to give him the opportunity to, to get that out. But I, I never realised that he would tell us the things he did. Where were you living in 85, Les? I was on the Kingsmead with a friend. Stephen Barrell. <laughs> Stephen and me used to work on cars. Robert Oliver lived there in a flat with a load of other men. Went up to Robert's flat to borrow a screwdriver. And as I was leaving, I popped my head round the corner and looked into the living room. There was a boy on the settee lying face up. wrapped in a grey blanket. His f face was white. What's the matter with him? He's ill. I'm taking him to the hospital. Weren't you worried about the boy? I just thought he was ill. A little while later, Sid and Robert came down the stairs carrying a long, thin bundle. The back door of the jag was uh, already open. I stopped working and watch them. Where exactly was his car parked? If you take me out there, I'll show you. Les, it seems as if you're uh, more involved than at first we thought. I've just been to where you said you were working on the car, and you couldn't possibly have seen what you said you saw. I think we'd better have a chat, don't you? Is there much more to tell, Les? I knocked on the door. Someone answered. In the door. Who invited you in? Uh, C. 
said, he asked me to go into the bedroom. There were other men there, and Jason. Where was Jason? On the bed. I held his wrist. He went white. Tear ran down his face. He went unconscious. Said, said they were gonna take him to hospital. He made me go with him. Where? He ended up in a f field. Sid drove the Jag. Who took the body down to the Jag? Me, Sid, and Robert. Liz, I'm arresting you for the murder of Jason Swift. You're not obliged to say anything unless you want to, but what you say will be given evidence. Do you understand? Right, Leslie, this gentleman over here behind you sitting is, is Captain Thompson. He's from the Salvation Army. And I've invited him to come along to this interview so that he can see and, if you like, make sure that the interview is conducted fairly. Leslie Bailey was um, an intellectual lightweight with uh, a speech impediment. Um, he'd um, had a poor education and Defence Council could easily uh, portray him as a, a malleable, individual who was open to a suggestion. And so keep an eye on my pen to make sure you're not going too quickly for me, all right? He chose not to have a solicitor, okay. and um, this was a worrying factor, and he, neither did he want anybody else present. And um, in those circumstances, uh, it was necessary to have some insurance for both him and I. And so um, aware of the fact that uh, in, in the court, it's easy for a police officer to be accused of ill treatment or lying. Um, I chose to have a Salvation Army officer present who really could be accused of neither of those. Leslie, I want to go over what we discussed this morning in the car. First of all, who opened the door to you when you went to the flat? Sid. I had to be there for Leslie Bailey's interest to make sure that he uh, was treated fair, that there was no undue pressure, that there was no leading questions. The police made it quite clear to me that my bias was towards Leslie Bailey and his interests. And for that purpose, I sat in on the interview. Joyce, had you seen these blokes before? They, it was quite traumatic. Um, first of all, I wasn't quite certain what I was going into, and having listened to all the details of what had happened, I came away with a um, turmoil, terrible turmoil in my thinking over what I'd sat and listened to. I had to read his statement back to him, which was 47 pages long, and in the statement used words that I wouldn't normally use. So it, it really left quite a mark on me for quite a long time. I remember when I got home thinking, I won't do this again. I really don't want to be part of this. Of course, we would have all liked it to have been an Essex breakthrough. But uh, having said that, the, the whole inquiry was centred within the Metropolitan Police District. So if anyone was going to crack it, it was going to be those. Well, cheers. 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 I had become convinced that the Jason Swift case would go undetected. 
This had been, in fact, the most expensive investigation Essex had ever run, and as always, there were financial considerations. It was more than a year and a half since Jason's body was found, and by now we'd wound the inquiry down to just three or four officers, and only seven lines of inquiry left to follow up. Two of those loose ends, of course, were Sidney Cook and Lenny Smith. For over 18 months, there'd been no evidence against them. But now that both men had been implicated by Oliver and Bailey, Essex police had good reason to talk to them again. Finding Cook was easy. He was in Brixton, doing two years for his part in an earlier paedophile case, the so-called Dirty Dozen. How long did you live on the Kingsway to stay? Since the 5th of September. So let's say from September till February sometime. Sydney Cook is speaking into the microphone. So let's say September, October, November, December. January, February, seven. Six months. Seven. Six months. And in that period of time, you're absolutely sure you didn't visit anybody else on the estate? Absolutely sure, absolutely del positive, bloody impossible, absolutely sure. Why would I want to visit Of all of them, Cook was the most difficult to interview. He was a very awkward person. He enjoyed being the centre of attraction. He would do various things to make himself the centre, from whining and whinging, trying to manipulate the interview and, and endeavouring to control it. The previous time I interviewed uh, Sidney Cook, some nine months earlier, he had effectively ended the interview by storming out of the interview room in a, in a fit of temper. On this occasion, when we were talking to him, uh, he would talk to us until we got close to the subject of Jason, and then he would try and turn the interview around, talk about anything other than Jason and his death. It seemed we were getting nowhere at that time. Have you got any complaints, Sidney? No. Is there anything else you wish to say? No. Are you sure? Yes. Well, it's seven o'clock and I now propose to have the tape stopped. But remember, Sydney, we'll be back tomorrow. I've got other questions to put to you, but we haven't discussed what other people have spoken about, have we? No, sir. It wasn't meant to happen. It wasn't meant to be like that. It was an accident. It was an accident. Things just went too far, that's all. What happened? Somebody grabbed him, drugged him, used him. Well, for the first time, he had admitted that he was actually there at the time of Jason's death. But again, he was endeavouring to manipulate the situation because he made this admission after the tape was switched off. So, though it was a partial admission, he was still thinking uh, all the time, uh, trying to trick us. But in admitting he was there, he confirmed my suspicions that we had the right man, the leader, the person responsible for the death of Jason Swift. There were six of us. Lenny, Robert, three others, and me. Who? I don't know. <laughs> Good morning, Stephen Barrell. Yeah? I'm DC Carr from the Essex Police. This is my colleague, PC Ostick from the Metropolitan Police. I'm arresting you on suspicion of being involved in the murder of a boy called Jason Swift in November 1985. You do not what was your part in all this, Sydney? They asked me if I wanted to. They asked you if you wanted what? You know! I'm Detective Constable Foster from Essex Police. You are being arrested on suspicion of the murder of Jason, of Swift. Jason Swift. We have reason to believe... You do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so. You but what you say may be given of Jason evidence. Swift. Do you understand? It shouldn't have ended like this. How do you know, Sydney, if you weren't there? Just answer the question. You're obviously getting upset. 
You clearly know more about this than you've told us so far. At one particular stage, Cook lay on the floor and demonstrated to us how Jason was held down by the various gang members and uh, how they performed certain sexual acts upon him. In my mind, Cook again was reliving the incident. He seemed to be enjoying it. And as before, he was trying to take over the interview. As wicked and perverse as it was, although he was telling us what happened, as I say in my mind, I was absolutely sure he was enjoying what he was doing then and there in the interview room. Sydney, you have told us about a most horrific assault on a frail young boy by, you say, six men, some of whom are known to you and you know their sexual history. What I want to know is were you a willing participant in this crime and I would like a truthful answer. I told you, sir, it wasn't meant to be like that. In order to have Cook in prison as long as possible, he wasn't charged until, six days later, he completed his sentence at Brixton. Sydney Cook, I'm Detective Constable Heard from Essex Police and I'm arresting you for the murder of Jason Swift on or before the 30th of November 1985. I'm obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. What you say you may be giving in evidence. Lenny Smith was also doing time for earlier paedophile offences and he was met on his release from Wandsworth Jail. I think you remember us. I'm arresting you for the murder of Jason Swift on or before the 3rd of November 1985. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you say may be given in evidence. In fact, Lenny Smith never went to trial for Jason's murder. His lawyers argued there was no evidence against him except the words of other paedophiles, people who were plainly unreliable. One of the problems that you face in these circumstances are that the people from whom the evidence is likely to come are invariably um, uh, low-grade witnesses. Uh, you would scarcely get somebody of the calibre of Caesar's wife coming forward and giving evidence. I'm quite convinced that uh, there were suspects who slipped through the net, um, who never reached court uh, or were not convicted, and that probably um, has meant that the inquiry has an incomplete side to it. Four of Jason's killers were convicted, but for lesser crimes than murder. No one could prove which of them actually caused his death. But they were sentenced to over 60 years between them. Sidney Cook got longest. One word from you, said the judge, could have stopped the agony of Jason Swift. These are the men who murdered Jason Swift. But did they also murder Barry Lewis? And maybe other children too? Detectives hadn't given up hope of proving their suspicions, but they couldn't have dreamt of how dramatic new evidence would be. Next week in Crime Watch File, the investigation continues as another Crime Watch case is followed through. Officers who have which some viewers will find distressing. What is it now, Gab? I've got to tell someone. Look, I wrote it all down. Jesus, is this straight up? I know, it's unbelievable. I swear it's true. Last week, Crime Watch File reported back to Crime Watch viewers on the murder of Jason Swift. The inquiry revealed a secretive underworld of child abuse and resulted in the conviction of several men who were operating a paedophile ring centred on North East London. That seemed to be the end of a deeply unpleasant episode. But it was just the start. One of Jason's killers confided in a cellmate in Wandsworth Prison. The cellmate was so sickened, he told prison staff, 
and the subsequent investigation was to become one of the most complex ever undertaken. It eventually resolved the murders of two other boys, whose deaths had remained unexplained despite Crime Watch appeals. A dog collar seemed the easiest disguise for a detective who had to be discreet. Hello, Ian. I understand you've asked to speak to a police officer. I'm Bob Brown, DI. You don't look like a copper. You've been sharing a cell with Leslie Bailey. What's he said that's upset you? The man is disgusting. He's bloody disgusting. It's little boys he's talking about. Little boys. If he's done a quarter of what he says, he should be banged up forever. Here. I'll blow your head off. I've written it all down. Everything he says, word for word. He was giving uh, graphic detail of uh, murders of children, um, burial sites, times, places. All of this came as a complete revelation. I was shocked to see the accuracy of it. In fact, two of the names on the front page of Gab's notebook were tragically familiar to the police. Four years earlier, in September 1985, six-year-old Barry Lewis had disappeared while playing near his home in South London. His remains were later found in a field near Ongar in Essex. About the same time, the body of a 14-year-old, Jason Swift, had been found not far away. For a time, the two murders had been linked, but while Jason's killing had been solved, Barry's death was still a disturbing mystery. Inspector Bob Brown had been instrumental in catching Jason's killers. It was one of that gang who'd been blabbing to his cellmate and whose stories recorded in a prison issue notebook Bob Brown now took home with him. That notebook was, as Gab had said, explosive. It listed victims and names of paedophiles, and several of those names were familiar to Inspector Brown through the Jason Swift investigation. Leslie Bailey, although you helped dispose of the boy's body, you came, I think, nearer than the others to telling the truth, and you get credit for that. On the counts of which you have been convicted, you must go to prison for 15 years. Robert Oliver, now I think it unlikely that on your own you would have used violence towards Jason Swift. However, you played your part and the sentence must be long. You must serve 15 years. Stephen Barrow, Alone of the defendants, you have no previous convictions for sexual offences. You must serve 13 and a half years. Sidney Cook. You bear the greatest responsibility for the events surrounding the death of Jason Swift. Of that, I have no doubt. A word from you and the cruelty to the boy would have ceased. What you did was utterly terrible. You must go to prison for 19 years. There were a number of uh, child murders of national importance which had featured in the inquiry and we were keen to look into in greater detail. Uh, we were looking for opportunities to expand the investigation. And of course, uh, when Gab came on the scene and, and the information that he supplied presented us with the perfect opportunity to do this. What do you think, sir? At first sight, I've got to say I find it totally inconceivable. What do you make of this man, Gab? Uh, as far as the content's concerned, it seems very accurate, and uh, I'm very familiar with the names that he's mentioning. Yeah, certainly your old mate, Bailey. My first reaction was uh, astonishment. We had a man who was locked up in prison, serving a long sentence for rape himself, who was prepared 
to give evidence against a fellow inmate. Right, now you've all read Gab's notebook and you all know what he's saying. What we've got to do now is to find out whether there's any truth in what he says. The team had to be small because we wanted to keep it confidential. That was important because um, the allegation was that 20 boys had been killed. There are a lot of parents who have children missing and we didn't want to cause them any unnecessary anguish without evidence that their children were involved. I picked Bob Brown, of course, because he knew all of the characters from the Jason Swift inquiry, as did Neil Bowden. And you report back on the progress you make from that research. But as he said, Dick Langley had been working in the same publications branch where he specialised in child pornography. And he'd learned a lot about how paedophiles worked. The way we're going to play it. It's a horrifying thought. So what I want you to do is go out and prove it's a load of nonsense. Prison informants must be handled carefully, if only for their own protection. Detectives named the operation ORCID. You understand we've been looking into what was written in the notebooks. And in the meantime, you're going to get a new cellmate. I didn't mean to it, they was winding me up something rotten. I just couldn't listen to him anymore. But what's important now is that you're able to cope next time. Just try and write down as accurately as you can what he tells you. Don't try and get him to confess. Okay. It was important that we never allowed him to ask leading questions. We couldn't suggest questions to him to ask of the fellow inmates. It had to come from them, otherwise the evidence would have been inadmissible. I was still very sceptical about the whole thing, but we decided to take it one more step by letting Gab share with another of Jason's killers. Hello, I'm Robert Cook. I'm your new cellmate. Thought I was getting a geezer called Oliver. Oh, no, no, not anymore. I changed my name in honour of my dear and close friend, Sidney Cook. <laughs> well, we're going to live together when this is all over. Oh, oh. There are things I could tell you about, dear Sidney. <laughs> the things he used to get up to. Oh, yeah. Bob, Such an this guy never stops talking which is great in many respects, but as you so rightly warn me, he is apt to exaggerate. Fortunately, it's quite easy to tell when he's doing this because the exaggerations are really quite fantastic and quite unbelievable. Jason Swift, remember Jason Swift? It's not easy to stop him once he gets started, is it? He is totally selfish. He just doesn't have a thought for anyone else. Like Bailey, he doesn't show any concern over the death of Jason Swift. Unlike Bailey, he manages to pull faces and appear to be putting some form of effort into expressing himself. Even so, the expressions contain no remorse, no sympathy, no pain, no concern. Well, we had to devise a system where Gab could get letters out to us without going through the approved channels, because we didn't want people knowing what he was doing inside the prison. Another one for you there, love. Thank you. He was a rapist himself, um, accused of sex crimes, and yet he seemed to think that his crimes were natural uh, when compared with the activities of the paedophiles, which I think genuinely disgusted him. And therefore, that, that was his reason, I think, for helping us in the way he was. Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I find it almost impossible to believe what I'm hearing. What's difficult to come to terms with is that Robert shows no remorse. When he talks about all the other sex acts committed by himself and his friends, he's so matter-of-fact. Just a few for you. Here you go, Dick. Oh, cheers. Thank you. Bob Brown, the detective inspector, got moved to the flying squad. I'd been introduced to Ian and Gabby in prison to build up some trust between the two of us. And when Bob moved, I took over as his handler. Gab was uh, very difficult to deal with. He was quite intelligent, uh, very eager to please. But he found the whole thing very frustrating, particularly if I tended to not go near him for a few weeks. He would think that uh, we weren't actually doing anything. Another one from Monster, Dick? Yes, Gab. He's getting a bit upset. I don't need hype and I don't need to be patronised. 
This work I'm doing, and believe me, it is work, I am doing for free because I want to see this scum brought to justice. And I want a judge who, at the end of the day, is not scared to sentence the criminals to a proper long term in prison. The only reward I will get will be this. It's getting too risky. I think we're going to have to move him. Okay, we've been in with all over, what, two months? Are there any advantages in hanging on in there? Well, a lot of us talking all the time. The quality of the intelligence coming from him is not as good as Bailey's. And I think that uh, Gab's likely to blow it and hit him. Gab had um, problems inside the prisons, obviously with association with the prisoners we were asking him to share cells with. And at certain times things just got too much for Gab and we in fact had to cool things down and remove him from the um, situation to release pressures on him. Ian Gabb may have been frustrated by the apparent lack of progress, but the ORCID team was slowly growing as his secret correspondence helped to build a case. Each piece of information had to be checked out and every known paedophile in London had to be reviewed. One name kept coming up again and again, time after time, and that was the name of Lenny Smith. He'd been strongly implicated in the case of Jason Swift. However, charges at that time had been dropped against him. It was decided that it would be best to invest time in surveillance with regard to Lenny Smith, and in fact, this surveillance paid off. 269 from 17. Yeah, go, go. I'm in a TK, I've got eyeball. He's in the park on his bike. He's towards the toilets. Yeah, roger, roger, thank you, stand by. All units from 269, I've got an OP and I can see the target coming towards me now, stand by. All units, all units from 269, I've got the target in the toilets. Where are you 290, Anna? 50 yards to your left, OP. Where are you 291? On the bench, over. OP from 290, do you want us to go in, over? But stand by, we think there's a child in there. Yeah, go now, go, go, go. The child was badly scared, but physically uninjured. Even so, Lenny Smith was convicted of indecent assault and was given a three-year sentence. Meanwhile, inside Wandsworth Prison, Ian Gabb was still prepared to help in any way he could. Six weeks since he'd been moved from Robert Oliver's cell, the Orchid team decided to play for the highest stakes of all. What you did was truly terrible. You were the dominant influence. One word from you could have stopped the agony of Jason Swift. Dear Richard, I moved in with Sidney Cook yesterday afternoon. Please, God, don't ever let this man walk our streets again. He continually talks about sex with children. But it's really sickening. I can tell you that there are probably 25 to 30 dead children buried out there. Cook has already admitted to me that he's seen about 15 killed. He boasts of this figure. All that I write is the truth. The only part that is missing is the creeping feeling of evil I get while listening to Cook tell me of these events. I cannot relate the fear I feel for children everywhere. That I feel while this man Cook laughs and squeals in delight as he tells me of the things he has done and the things he intends to do in the future. I have just about had it. I'm getting annoyed and if I stay any longer I might do him an injury. Get me out, quick. When Gabe shared a cell with Cook, he only lasted a few days. Um, I don't actually think anyone could have lasted longer than that uh, because Cook was talking about the murder of a number of kids, a number of horrendous offences against children. And uh, I think it just got too much for Gabe. Ian Gabb's role in Operation Orchid was now over. 
but he'd set in train what would become a huge inquiry. It was very difficult to understand Gab's motivation because he was not promised anything in return for the information he was giving us. He, he didn't discuss a reduction in sentence or special privileges whilst in prison. He just wanted to help us to clear up the crimes that he was hearing about. At one stage, Gab even volunteered to remain in prison beyond, beyond his uh, term of imprisonment, which seems a strange thing to do. But I think he was genuine in, in his motivation to get to the truth and provide evidence against the paedophiles. The evidence supplied by Gab was remarkable in its precision. It included a series of maps drawn by Leslie Bailey and purporting to show where the bodies of several of his victims had been buried. The time for secrecy was over. One of the maps that Bailey drew for us looked very promising and we decided that we'd de excavate one of the sites. But unfortunately, once it did become public, because we were looking for a, a missing boy, it became public in a big way. And it became a, quite a big media event, which made it very difficult for us, who were trying to professionally dig up a plot of land. The time for secrecy was over. One of the maps that Bailey drew for us looked very promising. And we decided that we'd de excavate one of the sites. But unfortunately, once it did become public, because we were looking for a, a missing boy, it became public in a big way. And it became a, quite a big media event, which made it very difficult for us, who were trying to professionally dig up a plot of land in Stoke Newington. Nothing was found, but now public interest had been alerted. The police published a telephone hotline number in an attempt to get confidential information from youngsters who'd been working as rent boys. I saw the telephone number on TV tonight. My son's been gone four years. He was 12. Perhaps he'll ring you. Please let me know. If you find my son, please tell him he can come home. We miss him. Tell him we're sorry. It was heartbreaking. Instead of actually getting calls from rent boys, we were in fact continuously getting phone calls from mothers and fathers of missing boys, lost boys. Boys that have been gone for some number of years that they hadn't seen. We got so many phone calls that during the night time, I had to bring officers in to change the answer phone. The phone rang continuously for over 24 hours. Please, if my boy rings you, please tell us, or if you find him. We don't know what's happened to him. We don't know where he is. We didn't realise that there were that many missing boys. And uh, you're looking at children here, aged from 11, 12 upwards. And some have been missing for a long time. And the parents saw us, naturally enough, as a means of trying to find out where their children were. The phone calls were distressing, but they were distracting from the inquiry. Instead, the ORCID team now focused on a single issue. What had happened to Barry Lewis? His was the first name in the Wandsworth prison notebook, and there was a wealth of clues from earlier inquiries. Run BTM. Um, soon after they went missing, and arrests Coming were made. Farm. But there was no trace of the fourth child, six-year-old Barry Lewis from Side South London. Two, ready to zoom in. Four and a half years earlier, Crime Watch UK had reconstructed Barry's last known movements. After the child had disappeared, Several witnesses saw a white man with a small black boy in the Waltham Abbey area, east of London. Seeing the boy and the petrol can, a local man on his way home stopped to help. The driver took them back. It was always thought that the boy must be buried and that the man must be his killer. But we had never been able to prove it or to discover exactly what had happened between the time the pair were dropped off at the car and the time Barry's body was buried. Bailey's map put him squarely in the frame and we decided it was time to talk to him directly. Is this the boy you're talking about? Yeah, that's him. I was working on a car outside Ashmead House and one or two of them, I think, came up to me and said there was a boy upstairs in the flat. In 
In previous interviews, Leslie Bailey had denied all knowledge of Barry Lewis. Now, five years after Barry's murder, and after many hours of questioning, he slowly opened up. Where did Barry die? In the car. Why did you do it, Les? Woke up. Started to cry. Les, show me on Gary Lyons how you did it. Well, he had very cold, clammy, sweaty hands, and he placed both of them on my face and pressed into my skull. It was quite a frightening moment uh, in the sense that I, I felt when he put his hands on my face to indicate how he'd killed him, that the last time he'd put his hands on somebody's face, he had actually killed them. Um, in my profession as a police officer, we're in the business of obtaining confessions from people. Um, but I could honestly say, I don't really know if I'd ever want to hear another confession again if it was in those circumstances. Some facts about the case, notably the pathologist's report on Barry's body, had been kept secret, even from the interviewing team. Only the murderer could have known several of the details that Leslie Bailey was describing. Members of the public do from time to time confess wrongly to crimes, and if they don't know the vital clue, then they can be eliminated from the inquiry. The method of um, Barry Lewis's death, how he met his death, was confidential to me and to the officer who had previously investigated his disappearance and none of the inquiry team knew and that was a safeguard for them and in Bailey's case so that we could be sure that he was the killer. Bailey was taken out of prison to retrace the fateful journey he'd described. They said there was going to be a pie what kind of party lads? A gangbang. Who was there? I knew seven or eight of them. But there were more. Where was Barry? In one of the bedrooms. How did he get into the flat? One of the gang brought him. He held his hand, gave him sweets and that. Was he drugged? Someone gave him a big round thing. Like a sweet. Was he crying? He wanted to go home, yeah. Leslie Bailey said that after six-year-old Barry had been left for dead, he had been ordered by other members of the gang to dispose of the body. It's changed. Pumps, different colour. Is there anything else we should be looking out for from here, Liz? There's a cottage where the lane starts. When he took us back to the field, he went immediately to the spot. We were all quite amazed because taking into account the great storms of that winter, a large portion of the scenery had been totally changed from the last time he was there. So really, when he got there and went straight to the spot, it really confirmed it in all our minds that he was telling the truth. Leslie Bailey, you were charged with the murder of Barry Lewis on or before the 7th of December 1985 within the jurisdiction of the Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey. 
Since going public, it had been a deliberate policy not to correct the exaggerated stories which appeared in the press. We knew the gang would be reading the papers avidly, especially the tabloids. We wanted the message to get through to them that we were after them. Yes, thanks very much. One day, yeah. one day. That's Wandsworth. It went smoothly last night. Cook safely tucked up in Orkney. And Oliver's been taken to Dartmoor. And he's none too happy about it, by all accounts. And Bailey's as we discussed? As we discussed. Ready and waiting. We were dealing with this afternoon. Great. Lovely. The strategy was to cause them maximum disruption while they're inside prison. We wanted them to be going to bed of an evening, not knowing what was going to happen to them in the morning. It very much was a question of feeding them snippets of information, either through the press or through friends that visit them, letting them know that we were actually looking at them. And whereas they've been serving their sentence quite happily, eating their breakfast, having their tea, living their life, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they realised that there was a special squad actually looking at them and looking at what we believed they'd done to other children. My aim was to see if one of them, perhaps, realising that the police were looking at them, would actually admit the truth about some of the other murders. Are you feeling all right, Les? It's going to be another day like yesterday, OK? We know you've been talking about the boy, Mark Tilsley, and we think it's about time we follow that up now. OK? That's who we're going to talk about today. It's a photograph of Mark Tilsley. Do you recognise him? Mark Tildesley had disappeared six years earlier in 1984 when he was seven. He'd been visiting a fair near his home in Wokingham in Berkshire. Mark was a lively young lad. Mark used the town as his playground and riding his bike around the town, getting in everybody's way. Everybody in the town knew him. I'd known him since he was born because his mother used to work at the police station as a cleaner. I was part of the family, as far as I was concerned. And I felt the same way Mark was concerned. Mark's failure to come home from the fair led to a massive police search. His bike was found, but nothing else. Do you recognise this, Leslie? It's a map you drew in Wandsworth. You told your cellmate it showed where Mark Tilsley had been killed in Wokingham. Remember, Mark, don't you? And you also wrote a letter about him. Well, you didn't write it. You got your cellmate to write it, because you don't write too well, do you, Liz? I'll remind you a bit of what it says. I have been questioned about Mark. Do you remember 1984 at a fair? Your mate Oddbod. What can you tell me about Mark, Leslie? Then he asked me to drive him there. Drive him where, Liz? Wokingham. The fair. He said there was... would be a party later. And what did you understand by that, Liz? I thought he meant blokes. What, all blokes together? Yeah. Leslie Bailey had a mild learning disability, which in his case meant limited understanding. And he had a right in law to, when being interviewed, to have present a person fulfilling the role of appropriate adult to protect his rights. And I fulfill that role during all the time that he was being interviewed. The time is 11. 50 am. I'm going to turn the tape off. You ladies okay? Fine. Is you okay? Yeah. He had limited understanding. So, if they, for example, one was saying on such and such a date, um, where were you doing X and Y? And this would mean absolutely nothing to him. And often you had to put the question in a different way. For example, say it was, was it summer or autumn? Were there leaves on the trees? Or was the sun shining? Was it wet or cold? Or what time of day was it? Was it in the morning? Was it beginning to get dark? 
He had his own moral code, but it was different to ours. It was a different one. Um, he had been abused as a child, and he'd had abusing relationships, so it was a very different view to ours. I sat on my motor waiting for Lenny. He came with another man. They had a young boy with them. Who is the other man, Liz? Well, I didn't know then, till they got to the car. Then, Lenny told me it was Sid. The other man's name was Sid. A young boy, was he just walking freely? No, he was sort of dragging back, like holding back. You mean like tugging on the man's arm? No. He was trying. Take your time, Liz. Trying... sort of... to get f free. You had to dis detach yourself from what he was actually saying and try and be professional about the whole thing, because... Uh, I know if I'd actually really started to think deeply about what he was saying, um, it would have been very distressful. I have nothing but admiration for the inquiry team. They spent day after day, hour after hour, week after week, sitting closeted with people who were relating horrendous details of what they'd done to young children. Most of them are adult, experienced police officers who could deal with the stress and the problems that they encountered. For example, Dick Langley would take himself off fishing and, and I couldn't help him with that because I'm not a fisherman, but you could go and have a drink with them after work, just settle down, talk to them and uh, generally pat them on the back, tell them how well they'd done and uh, hope that they'd calm down sufficiently to go home and deal with their family lives. Once more, Bailey was taken out of prison, this time to Wokingham, to check the accuracy of his recollections against locations he'd described and to try to retrace Mark's last hours. On the day that we went back to Wokingham, I was convinced that we were being followed. We were all aware at that time that there was much media speculation as to what was actually happening during the conduct of the investigation, and that some of the newspapers were starting to link the inquiries into Jason Swift with the Mark Tilsley case. We were obviously concerned that the investigation did not become a media circus. This would not have helped the investigation and would certainly not have helped Mark's family. When Leslie first came back to Wokenham, I felt that although the Met lads had done a wonderful job, this was my case. This is the one I've been on since the day the lab went missing. And I felt very emotional about it and him being there. I'm wondering if when I first saw him, if that was our link to telling us what happened to Mark. Have you remembered the name yet, Leslie? OK, Gary, go round again. Leslie was fairly certain when he first came back to Wokenham as to where he'd parked his car. But of course, there was a difficulty in that the fairground that was was being dug up for a municipal swimming pool and we were driving around in circles until he recognised one road. There. It's that E road just down there. We 
walked into the field together and he pinpointed exactly where Sidney Cooked had parked his caravan, which way it had been facing, how close to the fence it was. It was an experience that really just made the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. He was there again with the boy at the time that boy was killed. Leslie went into the middle of the field with one of the Met officers and you could see Leslie visibly shake and change. And then I knew that we had somebody who knew what had happened to Mark and was probably there when he died. It wouldn't have taken a lot for me then, I don't think, to have burst into tears. What I'd like you now to look at is a reconstruction of Mark's disappearance that went out on the television in 1985. It was about this time last year that the papers were headlining the disappearance of Mark Tilsley, 10 miles from Reading in Berkshire. The Crime Watch reconstruction in 1985 had had a huge response, but little concrete evidence had emerged. Now, six years later, Thames Valley officers reviewed the tape in partnership with the Metropolitan Police. Operation Orchid was now a large, combined inquiry. It's never an easy thing to run a joint operation um, for simple reasons, silly reasons really, things like interforced jealousy um, can prevent a, a joint operation from working correctly. But we felt that um, from the start we had to make a statement, so Mick Short and myself decided that we would pull every bit of information, that nothing was kept from the inquiry teams, um, so that really, instead of being two forces investigating one murder, it was one force investigating several murders, and uh, I think we maintained that cooperation until the end. One man became central to the inquiry, a fairground worker whom several people, as well as Bailey, had placed in Wokingham on the day Mark had disappeared. But he'd had an alibi. Sidney Cook said that he'd been working at another fair near Henley on the day. Now, with witnesses from Wokingham, his story began to crumble. It's number four. Cook must have made a deep impression. Sidney Cook said that he'd been working at another fair near Henley on the day. Now, with witnesses from Wokingham, his story began to crumble. It's number four. Cook must have made a deep impression. It was more than seven years since Mark had been abducted. It's four. Number four. I think you said there was a devil in you that you couldn't control. There's a devil in all of us. And you said that 90% of the time you could control it. Yeah. There's a devil in you. And there's a devil in him, and there's a devil in him. There's a devil in each and every one of us. So are you saying that it's this 10% of the time when you can't control the devil that you have these fantasies about the young boys? Yes, well, it's a stupid thing. I should have been firmer with my thoughts, with my fantasies. I presume that is what you're trying to say? Just plain, stupid mistakes. Well, most of the time, Cook had refused point-blank to say anything about the deaths of Barry Lewis or Mark Tilsley. And apart from the Jason Swift interviews, this was probably the closest we'd come to him telling us anything about the abuse of young children. By now, Sidney Cook was so deeply implicated in the murders of Barry Lewis and Mark Tilsley, police were confident they'd be able to press charges even without a confession. Meanwhile, the man who had confessed was tried and found guilty of murdering Barry and was charged with the manslaughter of Mark. But ironically, Bailey's admissions led to appeals by his co-defendants in the Jason Swift case. I believe the original trial judge would not have dealt so severely with you had he known of the full activities of Leslie Bailey and the full responsibility he bore in this matter. Sidney Cook, we quash the sentence of 19 years 
and substitute it with one of 16 years. Stephen Barrow, the sentence of 13 and a half years is too severe. We substitute for it 10 years imprisonment. Robert Oliver, now known also as Robert Cook, we see no reason to disturb the careful decision of the judge. Your appeal is dismissed. When the blame was laid fairly and squarely at Bailey's door, I find it offensive when Bailey was just the minnow and the sharks had their sentences reduced. In fact, worse was to come for the detectives. For months, the Orchid team had been waiting for a decision from the Crown Prosecution Service on what charges would be brought against Sidney Cook or Lenny Smith for the killings of Barry Lewis and Mark Tilsley. There'd be no more action taken against anybody. They'd made their minds up before I even got there. They just wouldn't listen to anything that I had to say. I was very depressed. I had a tremendous fight to get Bailey to court on the Barry Lewis murder. And yet afterwards, we seemed forever to be supplying the CPS with what they wanted, and prosecution counsel, witnesses to the others, and yet to no avail. It seemed to me that whatever we did, we were never going to get anybody else to court. And it was very depressing. Lenny Smith was serving his three years for the indecent assault on the boy in the public lavatory. He refused to cooperate with Operation Orchid. A number of witnesses linked him to Barry Lewis and Mark Tildesley, but again, the CPS felt it was not enough. Some of their arguments were on the basis that the people that we had got who were witnesses were not credible witnesses because they were criminals and paedophiles themselves. Well, I'm very sorry, but if you're dealing with paedophiles, the only persons who can give evidence against them are victims, in our case, who were mostly dead, or fellow paedophiles who witnessed and took part in some of the activities. We're not talking about stealing a bar of chocolate from Woolworths. We're talking about the violation and killing of young boys. Obviously, if there is no evidence against a person, we can understand that there should be no charges against that person. But we weren't arguing that there wasn't evidence. There was evidence, and some credible evidence, which is what a trial should be based on. It's just that they didn't believe that they would result in a conviction. Bailey alone stood trial for Mark Tildesley's killing. Leslie Bailey has acknowledged that on the 1st of June 1984 he agreed to drive a man he knew, a man called Lenny Smith, to Wokingham. And that on the journey down, Smith told him that a man called Sidney Cook had arranged a homosexual party in his caravan that evening. Sidney Cook dragged Mark Tilsley to his car and gave directions to his caravan in Evendon's Lane. There, the boy was drugged and undressed. The men all took their clothes off and one after another, beginning with Cook and ending with Lenny Smith, they buggered Mark Tilson. It is highly unusual for the prosecution to name so explicitly men who have not been charged. It was the closest the Crown would come to putting the others in the dock. Equally unusual, Leslie Bailey instructed his own defence barrister to seek the maximum sentence possible. I have come to understand my client and he would like very much to be able to shed some light on the mystery of where Mark's body is, but he can't. The significant fact in dealing with the killings of these three boys is that the man you have to sentence is the only one who has sought to clear the air. The others have always remained silent. My client is surprised and disappointed that he's here in the dock on his own today and that Smith and Cook are not here with him. He does not understand why this should be so. This has been the most tragic case I can imagine. The distress of the parents is enormous. Leslie Bailey was sentenced to life to run concurrently with prison terms he was already serving. 
All the officers in the case received a judge's commendation for pursuing an honourable and sustained investigation. But that was small compensation for what detectives acknowledged in public was unfinished business. One of the main aims we set out at the beginning of the inquiry was to find the body of Mark. We failed and I feel I failed the family. Mrs Tildesley will never give up her search for Mark until that body is found. I've told her that I'm certain Mark is dead. A man has pleaded guilty to the killing. But nevertheless, she still has that hope and that hope will continue. As far as Leslie Bailey is concerned, I don't believe he is the most wicked of the people that killed Mark. In fact, in many respects, he was the least guilty. The other men, I believe, are evil and I'm certain they will come out of prison. And when they come out, I'm convinced they will kill again. You feel for Mrs Tildesley. Um, you feel for other mums and dads that don't even know what's happened to their children. And you know there are evil people. And, and I believe, certainly in two cases, there was ample evidence to put those people before the court. Young boys were being carried out of flats on the Kingsmead estate in Hackney without anybody apparently noticing or phoning the police or in any way caring about what had occurred. It's a very worrying situation. Out of all the inquiries I've ever been on, and I've been a police officer for nearly 26 years, it's the one that still comes back to me time and time again. And I find that at a quiet moment in the day, I'll be thinking about something to do with these boys and the charges that were never brought.